Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are, and welcome to the Elenos Group web webinar on Dougherty Technology for Broadcast Transmitters, a technical discussion. Um, I'm Chuck Kelly, your host, very glad to be with you, and very glad to be joined by Mr. Perry Priestley, COO and CSO of Broadcast Electronics, and a very knowledgeable guy in the field of television. Welcome, Perry. Good afternoon, Chuck. It's good to be here. Thank you. Nice to have you with us. So here's a list of the things we're going to talk about. We're going to introduce the LNOS group, unless you're, uh, if you're not familiar. We're going to introduce a gentleman by the name of William H. Dougherty. You may know the last name, but you may not know his history. We'll go into a little bit more about that. We're going to talk about how AM transmitters and TV transmitters are similar and how they're different. And we're going to talk about various types of amplitude modulated amplifiers, including conventional class AB, envelope average modulation tracking, the CON EER amplifier, average power tracking, and then get into Dougherty power amplifiers and the various subsets of that. And then we're going to have a little summary. So um, I do want to mention a couple of things. First is that if you have questions at any point during the webinar, uh, just hit the little questions button on your uh, go to webinar tab at, on your right hand side of your screen, I believe, and type it in at any point in time during the presentation. And at the end of the presentation, Perry and I will do our very best to answer all your questions. The second thing I'd like to mention is that the Society of Broadcast Engineers very kindly allows you to take a half a credit for recertification, uh, uh, for SBE recertification for watching this webinar. So don't forget to mark it down and, and, uh, and uh, keep that information just in case you need to recertify for SBE. Lastly, just in case you find something interesting here and you want to go back to it later, we will have both the recorded version of this webinar and the a PDF of all the slides for you so you don't have to take notes. Um, and, and that will be on the same page that you used to register for this webinar. So all that housekeeping out of the way, let's trudge on. The Elenos Group includes the companies Elenos, Satelco, BE, and Pro Television, and we have over 60,000 installations worldwide in 130 countries and over 90 years of experience. Makes me feel old, Barry. <laughs> yes, and, it's all a, all a state of mind though, Chuck. Yeah. The, uh, here's the various companies. Elenos was founded in 1977 in Ferrara, Italy. The Telco broadcast began in 1962 in Orvieto, Italy. Both of those, by the way, if you ever get a chance to go to Italy, are absolutely beautiful places, lovely to visit. Broadcast Electronics, established in Quincy, Illinois in 1959. Actually, it started in Silver Spring, Maryland, not far from where you are, Perry, but right. uh, moved to Quincy, Illinois. And uh, Pro Television Technologies was established in Denmark over 50 years ago. And uh, a very, very exciting company. A lot of very interesting technologies brought together in this group. Let's talk about Mr. William H. Dougherty, the subject of our presentation today. He graduated from a, with a broadcast, uh, with a, a BSEE uh, and a master's degree in electrical engineering from Harvard. Uh, he no, invented, go ahead. That's, a, that's not a bad degree, I guess. No, not bad at all. He invented what's called the Dougherty Amplifier in 1936 when he was working for um, Bell Laboratories. And so the, the, the patent in 1940 was assigned to Bell Labs, which just turns out to be 80 years ago next month. Um, it was first used in Western Electric AM transmitters, and there were further substantial developments by Continental Electronics in a 50 kilowatt AM transmitter. So the very first time this amplifier was used was for AM broadcasting. And the reason is very simple. Um, it works by combining two amplifiers, the main amplifier and the peak. And the reason that this was uh, important was because an AM amplifier of, of that time was a linear amplifier, was a class AB amplifier, and a certain set amount of power was gonna be dissipated no matter what. In the amount that went to the antenna was, was, sep uh, was subtracted from that amount of power, and the rest was heat, always heat. So if you had no modulation, you had 100% heat. 
Um, and what he did was he said, okay, there's going to be two amplifiers. You can see on the screen here, there's a tube. And uh, the main amplifier is class AB. And you can see a 90 degree um, network here. And then the peak amplifier is a, a another tube. But interestingly, look at the bias. The bias of this one has three drawn cells. And the bias of the peak amplifier has six cells. And that means that the peak amplifier doesn't turn on at the same point that the main amplifier turns on. It's closer to the peak amplifier is closer to class C. So that amplifier is off until needed. And in this case, the 90 degree network is at the input side. So uh, very interesting. We do things almost exactly the same way 80 years later. Um, we don't use uh, glass vets anymore. We use <laughs> <laughs> transistors, but, but but it's the same exact concept and I find that absolutely fascinating. So this, yeah. this drawing, is part of the schematic, which was part of that U.S. patent application back in 1940. Remarkable. It is. And it's interesting to know that probably none of us were actually alive when this was first developed and invented and put into practice. I sure wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating, isn't it? More things change. So analog TV has a lot in common with AM transmission. On the left here is an AM transmitter. On the right is TV. Both require very high linearity and have dynamic amplitude. The need for high linearity typically requires class AB amplification, which as I said, is very low efficiency. So a, a, a AM signal ends up looking like this after you go through this, this uh, uh, transmitter block diagram and the television signal looks like that, very similar to a, uh, an AM transmission. Now I should mention, and should stress that we're talking about analog TV. Digital TV uh, is a different bag of worms. It still requires linear amplification, but the waveform looks a lot different. All right, so these are the amplitude modulator design choices we're gonna look briefly at today. Perry, do you wanna talk about them? Yeah, I guess uh, there's quite a few selections here. There's, it, I guess it breaks down into three categories or four. We actually have you in, introduced the Khan envelope elimination system. The first one is the conventional glass class AB, often known as push pull amplification. Um, very low efficiency, but very high linearity. And that's pretty much what every TV transmitter operated with over the last you know, 50 years. Uh, a new technology called envelope average, average modulation uh, tracking or modulation tracking was um, developed in early 2000. It was obviously aimed at improving efficiency. It had a very high RF bandwidth. In other words, it wasn't uh, frequency dependent but it has the low modulation bandwidth. In other words, it's very sensitive to um, high frequency changes actually in the actual modulation characteristics. Um, maybe you should talk about the Khan sure. ER. So as, what, as what, a, what, what, has, what, what has supplanted um, a class AB amplification in AM transmitters is basically the Khan envelope elimination and restoration or Khan EER amplifier. Everything since plate modulated uh, tubes um, to the most ex interesting types of, of uh, uh, PDM type of transmitters or PWM transmitters. They're all part of the Khan envelope elimination and restoration amplification system. Khan is, yes, that Khan, the Khan from AM stereo, Leonard Khan. Um, but anyway, he developed this system which is extremely high efficiency, but has low modulator bandwidth, which is good for audio in AM transmitters but not good for video. Then of course we have an extension of uh, envelope modulation, which was called average power tracking. And that's, I'll go into a little bit more detail later, but that's uh, where the actual power supply follows the actual envelope to obtain a much higher efficiency. Um, again, same restrictions, it, uh, has, uh, it's complicated, uh, high RF bandwidth, but a low modulation bandwidth. It means it'll work on any frequency, but again, it's a fairly complicated circuit. And of course, the last one, which we're going to focus on most of all, and that is the Doherty amplification. Mm -hmm. And it has high efficiency and low RF bandwidth, and we'll go into why. 
Okay, so here is a conventional push-pull class AB amplifier AM modulator. Did you want to talk about it, Barry? Yeah, um, I'm sure most people are familiar with this uh, basic amplification technology, AB. It means it's uh, uh, a class AB, which means it's relatively uh, relatively uh, linear. Uh, so much nonlinear correction required. It's a much simpler circuit. It's made up of two uh, two basically combiner splitter systems. Very simple system, and as you can see from the picture at the bottom, uh, you can see the envelope, the blue signal, that's the signal being transmitted, and the red area is uh, fixed to uh, power level so that or everything that's not transmitted is wasted as heat. We, we, we mentioned a 30% transistor efficiency here, so if we looked at a modern day OFDM kind of TV transmitter, we would really look be looking at low 20s uh, in terms of system efficiency and right. that means 80 80 percent of your power that you're generating inside your transmitter is literally just being dissipated into the room or outside as heat and and totally wasted so you can see that it's simple it's easy um it's well proven but it is a very inefficient yep okay and then there's average modulation tracking Right, it's the first attempt to actually significantly improve efficiency. And as you can see here on the circuit diagram, you have the standard modulator feeding a standard class AB amplifier, but a sample is fed from the modulator into the DC to DC converter. Now this actually switches the actual power supply on and off when it's not needed. It works as a step function so that during low signal levels, the power supply drops and during high, high uh, envelope peaks, you, your power supply increases. Now, of course, this, this does improve efficiency. Adding this is looks relatively simple on this circuit, but don't forget, if you have 200 of these transistors, you also have 200 of these DC to DC converters, and that certainly increases complexity, complexity. but uh, you do see a nice improvement in efficiency, um, and you know, from 30 to 35%, that's a big change in uh, electricity consumption. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then there's envelope power tracking. It's basically the same as the previous drawing, but just taking it one, one step further, instead of just having a supply modulator here that switches on and off the actual DC voltage, you now actually uh, have the DC supply following the actual envelope. So as you can see, as the envelope, as the blue envelope changes, the power supply, the red line also changes at the same time. And ideally, you can now get efficiencies quite easily up to 40%. I have seen efficiencies over 50% in this function. You can't get this to actually go down to the very lower level. As you can see, it's not it's not possible to get zero tracking. It certainly is, um, it's possible to improve efficiency. So and that's because the supply modulator doesn't have sufficient bandwidth to track it precisely. Absolutely, yeah, you're absolutely right, Chuck. So, and of course, that is a complex circuit, and it's mm -hmm. not just one complex circuit. You know, in a 10 kilowatt transmitter, you may have 300 of these, and so that's a lot of uh, a lot of electronics to maintain and uh, monitor. So, but we do see a significant improvement in efficiency, and it's certainly a nice technology. And if you were only ever using one transistor, this probably uh, would be the you know uh, the best solution. Sure. Maybe. So. Sure. Okay. And now we're going to talk about the Con EER method. Now, all of the, uh, the systems that we've seen that we just discussed, the input to the actual PA is a fully modulated signal, something that you could listen to on a, a radio or a watch on a television set. But in the Con system, we actually separate out the amplitude and the phase or frequency. And so there's a limiter that takes the input signal, subtracts out all of the amplitude effects and gives you just the phase signal, frequency signal, which is driving the class C PA. Then there's an envelope detector that subtracts out the frequency information and gives you just the amplitude. And that goes into a modulator and that is the voltage drive for the PA amplifier, provides the PA voltage. And now you've got an amplifier which is quite efficient in some in some AM transmitters. You can have up to 90% efficiency with this type of circuit. But it really the 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 frequency response of the amplitude modulator is not sufficient 
for television. Works great for AM, but it, it's not sufficient for television. Are most uh, AM state most AM transmitters these days? Uh, yep. That kind of modification. Absolutely. So here we move back to Doherty again, um, the description of Doherty. And as you can see, this is a relatively simple circuit made up of two transistors. But now the transmitter transistors are biased in a different way. One is biased as a class AB carrier amplifier. We often call that as the main power amplifier. And then the peak power amplifier, the lower of the two transistors, down here uh, is class such that it's operating in a class C. Uh, so this transistor just amplifies the peaks and this transistor amplifies the actual carrier. The signal right. is split into two, uh, changed by zero and 90 degrees. So they're out of phase by 90 degrees. So you need to, when you recombine them, you need to put them back into phase. Uh, and this is the, I, I would say the most complicated part of a Doherty system is the output combining system. But as you can see, they're combined put through a matching section and then you get the actual output. We are seeing efficiencies of 30 to 60, 36 to 40%, uh, very conservative. Uh, typical efficiencies today of a standard Doherty uh, is in the mid 50, mid 40s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go into a little bit more detail. Okay, so there's various di different versions. The manufacturer, which used to be called NXP, which was previously Philips, is now Ampelon, um, have developed various different bar designs of Doherty and trying to optimize uh, various different categories of uh, performance. Uh, the first one was just a classical two-way Doherty system. As you can see here, you have two peak transistors and two main transistors being fed by a simple 90-degree hybrid uh, a splitter. Um, it performs, you get a pretty reasonable output power, but again, because of the actual combining network, you have a significant limitation in its operating frequency. In other words, it's narrow band. Uh, one of the nice features from this was that if you'd already developed a standard uh, fixed drain uh, amplifier, you could use the same pallet size. It had the same configuration, the, the same form, fit and function. It has the same gain, the same input levels, uh, the same kind of type of connections and so forth. So it was very easy to move to this kind of uh, um, uh, architecture uh, from a standard non-Doherty system. And a lot of manufacturers did that in the early days. Of course, Again, going back to the key problem here, it is narrow band. And so if you wanted to change from channel 14 to channel 21, for instance, you would have to change the entire structure of the actual amplifier. Is, is the reason that it's, it's narrow band because the, the hybrid splitter gives you pretty much guaranteed 90 degree difference um, inherently a, a relatively broadband, but this device here, this strip line, 90 degree network changes against frequency at a different rate than the hybrid. So therefore, it's only going to be 90 and 90 on a set frequency. And as you go away from that frequency, they diverge. You're absolutely right. Of course, they both have um, different power levels. You know, they're actually mm -hmm. one, one's one's just amplifying peaks, and that's gonna be a much smaller power level than the actual transistor. And if you have different power, that means you have different current, and if you have different current but the same voltage, everybody knows through Ohm's law, you actually have a different impedance. So you're trying to match impedances, and as these vary, and as the frequency varies, then the impedance changes. So you're right, it no longer is 90 degrees if it's not designed specifically for that, uh, that particular channel. So again, you're stuck with that limitation. You've improved the efficiency, but you've actually uh, limited the, the circuit to one or two TV frequencies. Gotcha. Okay. How does that change in this design? Well, really, they just tried to improve it a little bit in uh, expanding the, the band by uh, not having a quarter wavelength uh, uh, line system on the output, but just having a standard hybrid. Uh, this did did improve the bandwidth, but it didn't improve it that significant, and it has a lot of disadvantages in that, that it, it actually has second harmonic issues. Um, really, at the end of the day, it was a, a small step, 
to go for, to, to, to hybrid, but really not a significant improvement. So this was never really, the variant on the standard two-way Doherty was never really implemented by any manufacturer. Okay. And then we go to asymmetric Doherty wideband. Yes, yeah, this is the, the, the biggest step, I believe. And there's always a compromise between power and bandwidth, strangely enough, because again, as if you think about it, the more power, the bigger the difference in power levels between the main and the peak. Um, the bigger the difference, therefore the bigger the impedance change and therefore the, the co more compensation you require in the output. Uh, this system has uh, you know, really been pushed very well by the NXP, the developers of the transistors and efficiencies of greater than 50%. Some of, I've seen efficiencies closer to 60% obtained from the entire circuit. It does have a few disadvantages. Um, uh, it, it does, it is limited to around 150 watts output. Now, now that's 150 watts after filtering and combining and so forth. It does require a much larger size printed circuit board. So it's not a direct plug in to those, the original uh, class uh, AB uh, standard uh, non Doherty transmitters. So you really have to redesign your chassis, your amplifier uh, system. And the actual printed circuit board is like three eighths of an inch thick. So and that's another uh, design criteria you have to take into consideration. And of course, it doesn't have a balance, a balanced to unbalanced output. So uh, you do get harmonic issues and second harmonic, which you need to take care of in other parts of the circuit. And you know, most of these things that I see in this block diagram, close to a schematic, are, are pretty recognizable, the amplifiers, the line sections, etc. But this thing is different. Yes, it's basically a, an, an impedance matcher uh, to uh, the changes, it's impedance depending on the frequency, so that you balance the phases of the two devices. So yeah, it's uh, yeah, an unusual device and we'll get to see what that looks like in, in the real world. And that's very characteristic of a Dowerty amplifier. You can look at one of those things and right away you know this is a Dowerty amplifier. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, then there's this interesting one. Yep, it's another development that, that's taken one step further, efficiencies of greater than 50 towards 60 and uh, even higher uh, in terms of RF efficiency at board level. Uh, it's a dual system, so you actually have two transistors and they are independent, but uh, but matched together here with combining sections. So what you do is put it on two different levels of a circuit board and you have each circuit independent, but electrically phased connected together. And then obviously connect combined in the output. A really nice system, um, but it is a lot more complicated. And because you have two layers on the printed circuit board, it just means that thermal issues are, 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 are difficult to overcome. Mm -hmm. and the one thing, you know, just like any other Doherty, it's going to be band limited at, at some point. Uh, and if you extend beyond that band, uh, it's a lot more complicated to change. So literally, if you had to change frequency, you had to change the band, uh, you'd literally have to throw the circuit board away because it, it, it would be not modifiable to, to a broader band system. So uh, uh, it has some nice of advantages via efficiency. It is a little bit more complicated, but it again has a, some, some negative side. So it really wasn't jumped on by any of the manufacturers just yet. It may be in later years, but I personally don't see this as a a real big, uh, I'm not very optimistic as this being taken uh, seriously in development. Okay, and then looking at the future, looking at three-way Dowdy. Yep, just taking the two-way Dowdy and the, the, you know, the, the load effect from the main to the peak is lessened if you swap over the two peak, uh, swap over to have two peaks. So here you actually have two peaking transistors and of course the, uh, the consequent combining of the three networks. So if you have combined three different systems, the first thing that comes to mind is that it's complex and you much you need a much stronger adaptive correction. In other words, the supercomputer that we use needs to work a lot harder because you're correcting three 
totally different um, uh, types of signals from these two from these three devices. It operates pretty much the same as a two-way system. Uh, gives you again significant improvement in efficiency. We don't mention it here, but it's again in between 50 and 60 percent. Uh, the same kind of combining network at the output. Uh, again, I'm not sure if this is going to be a popular choice due to its uh, uh, efficiency. Not everybody has the, you know, the kind of corrector that uh, Elanos Group has uh, in the supercomputer, so I'm not sure it's gonna be ideal for everyone. It's uh, efficient, but not, but it may be a little too complex. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now we look at, we actually look at what uh, one of these cards look like, and, and perhaps yeah. you can tell us what's going on. Yeah, but this is a real circuit diagram, one that's used by a lot of manufacturers. Um, and, made up of three discrete cis parts. The first part is the input splitter, as we looked at before. So the signal comes in here and splits two ways in, through these two different circuits, uh, fed into a dual or asymmetric Doherty transistor. And then the output of the transistor, as you can see, feeds the, along these two unusual paths, the question mark path, as I call it, uh, and is combined into the output, and then finally uh, the output here. So this is the output combiner. Um, it's relatively easy to, you know, obviously you've got to keep the amplitude and phase very accurate going into, uh, into the circuit, and it's relatively easy to do that. Uh, the transistor made by, this particular one is made by uh, Ampelon, uh, standard uh, asymmetric system. In other words, the main and the peak are different types of transistor and operating in different configurations. Uh, you get less of what's called the load pull between the peak and the uh, and the, and the, the main transistor because of the design, uh, but you still actually have a frequency dependent component. And this is where this particular shape style is made up of inductors, capacitors, and resistance mm -hmm. here that turns into a, again, quarter wavelength uh, combiner, but because of this design and thickness changes, it allows you to, it uh, combines the signal in different parts of this, um, you know, depending on where it is, de uh, depending on the frequency. So you obtain a much broader bandwidth. We go from initially uh, 20 to 30 megahertz bandwidth up to about 140 to 150 megahertz. So you can have a much broader bandwidth. And of course, so it, it overcomes the bandwidth issue and it overcomes the uh, power issue, get up to about 150 watts out of this device. Uh, and it also, um, you know, you obtain the high efficiency that you need. Yeah, okay. And this is what it looks like in the flesh. Yes, yet yeah, turn from black and white to, to color, as they mm -hmm. say. So as you can see here, efficiency is greater than 50% uh, power output in OFDM, that's ATSE3 or ISDBT or DVBT2, uh, power levels of 150 watts. Uh, you would see probably 180 from ATSC, the regular ATSC. Standard sort of gain figures, typically even um, transmitters like uh, use, using even IO, IOTs and things like that had gains of around 18 to 20 dBs. Um, most amplifiers are designed at that sort of level and, and that fits, this fits in the category. So no real changes in terms of input requirements. You don't actually have to have much higher uh, pre-amplifier system. Uh, 150 watts output. And it does obtain pretty impressive uh, shoulders or intermodulation products. It's shown here without correction, you're at 38 dBs reference to the carrier level. So that's that's pretty impressive to start with. Of course, the harder you push this and you can uh, you know, adjust the biases and you can adjust the actual driver level, you can get more output, You, uh, but of course you compromise its uh, intermodulation products. But and the a, RF supercomputer with the adaptive pre-correction we can get better than 50, 50 dB of, yeah. uh, of shoulders. You're absolutely right, Chuck. Yeah, we've we've seen uh, shoulders as sometimes of, as up to 60 dB. So yeah, the you know obviously the better the shoulder correction, the better the MER, the modulation error ratio, and the, and the lower the noise, and of course that's better performance, which ultimately relates to better coverage. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the, the better this number, the higher this number, uh, the better more people most likely are going to receive your signal. And you've got it broken into three bands. So you'd have three board layouts, if you will. The components are largely the same, but the board layouts would be different. But interestingly, in the U.S. these days, after the repack, 
basically you, you can get taken care of with band one. So pretty much it's a broadband device for the US. Yeah, it's definitely a broadband device for the US, but if we expand it to some of the, you know, the international countries uh, that, re that still have 600 to 800 megahertz frequencies, right. then you're going to need a different band. And that's, that's a definite disadvantage because you, if you have a transmitter in band one and another transmitter in band two, then they are going to be different transmitters. You know, they're going to operate the same with the same exciter, controller, filter, filtering, et cetera, but the actual main amplifying device is going to be different and not not swappable between uh, stations, so right. a bit of a bit of a disadvantage there. Yep. Okay, and so when we, yeah, when Go we ahead. take that amplifying device, uh, and we, and this would be that amplifying device, we fit them into a transmitter. And so, how do you combine them to get higher powers? Because obviously, not everybody just wants 150 watts output. So, you combine them into a system. Uh, here's uh, you have some kind of preamplification system. Uh, the ideal system for uh, combining is a is, obviously be, because it's digital. Binary option would be to have two amplifiers or four amplifiers or eight or even sixteen uh, to to look at combined, which keeps the hybrids uh, uh, an even number. Uh, here you see an example that is recommended to have eight transistor systems or eight pallets. Uh, and then, of course, four hybrid combiners, then combining in two hybrid, and then finally combining in the one last hybrid. So this is the ideal situation. The problem with that is the, just the fundamental physics of the pallet means they are a certain width. You cannot reduce the width. And if you can't reduce the width, you'll now have to put eight of these in literally in parallel, and uh, that is typically too big for a standard 19-inch chassis, which is unfortunate, but it means if you want to buy an eight, if you want to build an eight pallet system, you have to go into a much wider transmitter, and that's not often um, li uh, liked by a lot of people because they're, you know, they're typically removing a 19-inch rack and want to replace it with a 19-inch rack. Sure. This is this system also has no way of removing the second harmonics that's often caused by Doherty. So um, it does have a bit of a disadvantage there. You have to put additional filtering, low pass filters on the output uh, to, to compensate for the, for the actual second harmonic. So this is the seven combiner system. Go to the next slide. We take that si same idea, but instead of going, having eight, we change this down to six. We have six pallets, which means we can fit it into a standard 19-inch chassis. It's obviously a better system design, uh, fits into a standard transmitter size. Um, and because of the uh, uh, uneven number, though, of course, you've got two plus two and then an additional one here, you have to have a 4.77 or a two-thirds dB hybrid com uh, combiner. Uh, with this combiner, you're going to lose uh, some of its efficiency. It becomes a lot less, uh, let's say, elegant in terms of its um, design. Uh, no, again, no second harmonic uh, reduction. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, just not the best best solution. If you lose an amplifier, especially uh, one of these in the middle, your power reduction is much greater than that of a symmetrical system. Yep. Okay. And then you move to what we consider the optimum, the best system design. It's always like anything else, a trade-off. It's a compromise between uh, maximum power, maximum power density, uh, but a high efficiency and simplicity. Why does it need to be simple? It's often fine that the simpler the system, the easier it is to maintain and, and ultimately the more reliable the product. Um, we have a, again, the same preamplifier system fed into a three-way splitter. The three-way splitter then <clears throat> it just simply combines into a three-way combiner. You cannot get it any simpler than this. Uh, gives you a much better uh, efficiency overall, less combiner loss. You do have lower second harmonic. Uh, the turnaround loss uh, is improved. Uh, but you still maintain the efficiency, and of course, it's a, a, a broadband device, as shown earlier. So you have all the advantages with very little disadvantage. The only one downside is that you're now looking at 800 watts output instead of uh, 1,200 watts that you would obtain from an eight-way transistor. Okay. Then you can take and put those things together and make transmitters of almost any size. Yes, you have to keep building blocks. So we take that 
block that we were just looking at, and there it is here, and we take uh, two of them to make 1200 watts. Now 1200 watts is very popular power, mainly because uh, with the appropriate typical an antennas and transmission line loss, you meet the 15 kilowatts ERP of standard low power television. So it's a very popular low power television product. Buying a single amplifier system limits you, you have one amplifier fail, you're pretty much off the air. Um, and that's not the best option. So we find from a reliability, maintainability system, having a two amplifier system with two simple 3 dB hybrid splitter and combiner network uh, gives you the, the, you know, the maximum reliability uh, long term. You can build from that from two amplifiers to three to four and to five, giving you up to three kilowatts output. Now this is all OFDM power levels, typically measured just before the filter. Uh, if you were to use ATSC-1, you'd be seeing obviously power levels of 20% higher. So this would be 1500 watts, and this one would be 3.6 kilowatts. Okay. So that all fits into a standard 19 inch frame, which is first of all, you know, just convenient uh, to install ex into your existing network. Um, but because we've spread the power level from 1200 watts to 800 watts, we've optimized the power density and that power density therefore is a lot easier to cool. If you make it easier to cool, it means it's easier to maintain. And if you're keeping the temperature low, uh, you are uh, definitely going to increase reliability. And that's an interesting point because it turns out that there is a a mechanism with solid state devices like the transistors we use um, where the actual point where you attach the leads to the silicon die over time and with heat that leaks into the silicon die and poisons the silicon die. And it's very uh, repeatable. It, it, you can predict it exactly. It turns out that for every doubling, uh, I'm sorry, for every 10 degrees C cooler, you keep a silicon die, you actually double the estimated MTBF of that device. So having a transmitter design where you actually design it for maximum cooling and keep the d silicon device itself, the die of the device cooler, makes a heck of a huge difference in terms of the uh, estimated life of that device. That's called metal migration. Yep, yep, you're absolutely right. That's a, a theory that's been proven over and over again. The, the only downside, of course, is that when you buy a transmitter, that, that, that effect doesn't Im immediately appear. Um, and right. you think, oh, great, I've got a great reliable transmitter. It hasn't gone off the air for a week. But mm -hmm. you know, given, given it weeks, months, and years, that's when the metal by integration starts to happen and that's when the failure happens and it's not something that you really want to see and it's all going to happen at the same time so you're going to be losing a lot of transistors and a lot of amplifiers very quickly it's interesting because when i moved in my engineering career from from tube type trans, uh, transmitters to solid state transmitters i assumed that when i got rid of filaments in tubes that I'd be looking at forever devices. As long as I kept them within their maximum ratings, they were going to last for forever. And that wasn't yep. true. And in fact, there's a mechanism that fails just as predictably as the <laughs> filaments in a tube. Yeah, and you have a lot more. That's the problem. You have a lot That's more right. to fill. Well, uh, obviously that does give you a better availability and, and, and redundancy uh, because you have a lot of transistors. But if you know the migration and the heat concentration is similar throughout the transmitter, then the failure is going to happen at a fairly consistent time. So at a specific right. date, you will see like the filament on a, uh, on a cathode or a, of, a, of a tetrode or various um, uh, you know, vacuum devices failed. The same thing is going to happen with the transistor. Yeah. Interesting how things change. Okay, so in liquid cooling, the whole thing has changed. You've got a lot more power density. You can have double the size of transmitter in the same rack. Yeah, absolutely. You're not restricted by the airflow demands, so you're not so so. Uh, you can you can put transistors in different configurations in different positions, uh, back to back, one in front of the other, because you're not required. You know, you don't have to worry about airflow 
So typical, the typical configuration is you double side the boards. You put uh, you know some transistors on top and some transistors on the bottom. Typically, that doubles the output. Um, you get six double pallets instead of three, so you get 1,200 watts per chassis quite comfortably. There are companies that have actually gone to eight pallets uh, and even higher than that and get higher power. Again. I think there's a limit to how many you should put into one chassis, again, to re reduce the power power uh, concentration. Power levels of up to 10 kilowatts, of course, are therefore available in a relatively small cabinet. And of course, when you're calculating the savings in terms of square footage of space that you're utilizing, don't forget that you have an external heat exchanger somewhere that's that's got to cool all that liquid. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, there's always the argument of complexity. Uh, people say, well, you know, liquid is, uh, uh, it's fine, you know, it never leaks, but there is no such thing as it never leaks. And secondly, there's there's gate valves and there's a hundred junctions in a typical installation. So, you know, it's one of those things, it's a balance, it's a compromise, it's a trade-off. You do improve efficiency, you do improve cooling, um, but, you know, you do increase complexity. They sure are nice and quiet though when they're running. What? They sure are nice and quiet. They're, oh, you've been around two air-cooled transmitters too long. <laughs> That's true. I've been around transmitters too long. Yeah, indeed. Okay, let's see here. All right. So let's talk about operating cost and analyzing it. Yeah, we you know we looked at three real realistic categories of amplifying devices. There's the fixed drain, the standard class A B type of amplifier. And that's this orange line that goes up like this. So you that's can right. see cost over here and transmitter output power over there and on an annual basis. Absolutely. And in the middle, we see um, uh, drain modulation and then, of course, doherty modulation. Mm -hmm. And you can so, see... Go ahead. Uh, you know, basically, at the end of the day, the higher the power, obviously, you're going to save more more money. Um, yeah, it's more important to use the latest technology, the most efficient technology at the higher power levels than it does at the lower power levels. In other words, down here, when you're running 100 or uh, 100 watts or so, um, there's almost no difference in terms of the operating cost from one to the other. But you get over here, 20 kilowatts, you can save, what is that, probably $30,000 a year? Mm hmm yeah, and that 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 becomes noticeable. So, it just a, it's a simple graph to show that in the one to two kilowatt area, you know, okay, Doherty has it does save you money, but uh, you know, you have to balance the compromise of bandwidth limitation and complexity to savings uh, at the very low power level. Uh, you know, 100 watts, as you mentioned. You know, at the end of the day, there's no ch there's no savings at all. A few dollars here and there, but um, you know. If, uh, but at high powers, it, there's there's real no question about it. It has to be a Doherty transmitter. Oh, you you have a network of transmitters and you know twenty or thirty uh, transmitters saving thirty thousand dollars a year. You're talking about real money. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, I guess I can cover this fairly quickly. You know, sure. which summarize the actual presentation. Uh, Average Doherty efficiencies have increased over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, it's now a proven product, and you're looking at efficiencies of 50% versus 25. I mean, it's simply you're going to cut your power bill at least in half. Um, mm -hmm. And so, as we said earlier, the big transmitters that's that could that turns into a lot of money. No, total those are those are PA um, efficiencies, not total right. transmitter efficiencies. Right, 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 and that reflects fairly similarly to a you know the total system efficiency. You're looking at a three kilowatt transmitter, probably still greater than forty five percent efficient, mm -hmm. compared to a three kilowatt transmitter uh, that uses you know standard class AB would be looking at twenty percent at, at right. best. Yeah, so, because you got power supplies and combiners and fans and and yep. all the rest of the stuff that goes into it. Absolutely. So it's not just the transistor, but that does make up the, the larger part of the uh, consumption. Mm -hmm. Of course, the less heat you dissipate, the, the the cooler the room is, the less amount of cooling you require. So you get a lot of more savings there. And as you mentioned earlier, Chuck, about the actual, uh, what was it? Um, Metal migration. 
capital migration, uh, it's a proven fact that the cooler you run a transistor, the longer it lasts. And there are some figures that say if every 20 degrees Celsius reduction, you get four times the reliability. And again, you don't see that in the first few years, but over a few, uh, you know, after five to 10 years, you might start to see real problems with, if the transmitter has not been designed properly. Yep. And of course, the new Doherty amplifiers that are pretty much cover the entire band, certainly for the entire band for North America, um, and e even only three bands required for, from 470 to 800 megahertz. So, uh, uh, you know, it pretty much covers all of this, less of a compromise between power, between performance, efficiency, and, you know, band limitation or flexibility of use. Sure. Okay. And let's see here. Why is this not doing? It's not advancing. Why not? We think. I think we have one more slide. Yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> and my, so I'll go to next here. See if we can do it that way. Okay. Yeah, just a just a pretty picture of all the transmitters available from the LNOS group, from one watt to seven point two kilowatts. These are OFDM power levels, of course. Um, mm -hmm. Available VHF band one and three at the lower power levels, UHF and VHF band three at the higher. Available in air cooled and liquid cooled, so everything available. We didn't end up with any particular questions, so um, we can go straight to the end and and, and thank everybody for uh, for being a part of our webinar. We do have more webinars that you can sign up for. Uh, go to www.elenosgroup.com forward slash webinar for signing up for our future webinars. Here are the contacts that you need to call contact if you have questions about. Uh, buying any of the LNOS Group products. We'd be delighted to hear from you. And thank you so much for spending some of your day with us. Thank you, Barry, very much for well, your knowledge and expertise. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chuck. For, uh, for Perry Priestley and myself, Chuck Kelly, and for the entire LNOS Group of companies, I want to thank you for being with us today. Bye-bye for now.